Hi, it's Steve. Today is day 25 of this 30 days of video series and I'm water fasting at the same time. Water fast is still going well. In fact, today my energy was great. Um, got tons of work done this morning. Um, the main thing I really don't like about the fast though is just that my physical energy isn't very high. Mentally, emotionally, I'm feeling good. But I really miss being able to exercise. I miss having like just more um, energy to move around. I miss like extra movement in my day. I can do a little bit here and there. And like yesterday, I went, you know, went for a walk on the strip with Rochelle, but I have to pace myself and go kind of slow. And I walk maybe like two thirds the speed I normally go. So that's just a little bit annoying. It's just not having much physical energy to do what I really would love to do. You know, I like being active a lot and just having to um, sit down so much and not move as much and get up and move slowly. <laughs> that part is kind of grating on me after a while. It's getting really boring. I really miss running. I love starting my days getting up early and going out for a run and listening to audiobooks. And, you know, like on the fast also, I need extra sleep. So that just that lack of physical movement and exercise is kind of getting to me. But otherwise, it's going okay. And, you know, now after today, I only have five days left to make it to day 30. Um, I'm actually thinking, you know, like I'm not encountering any difficulties. I'm thinking it might just be pretty easy to coast into day 30. So I'm considering going longer than 30 days. Um, I'm not going to keep doing the videos, although I might do like a video update after um, after day 30, like some, you know, around the time I stop the fast. Um, but after day 30, if I still feel like I can keep going, I'll just take it one day at a time and then decide, you know, if I want to go a little bit longer. The most I can go is about to 40 days. I can't really realistically go longer than that because I have an event um, that I'm speaking at in, um, in June. I think it's June... I don't remember the exact dates, but it's around June 10th or so. So I want to give myself at least a couple of uh, a couple of weeks to, you know, gradually transition back from the fast. Um, and there's a gala dinner. I think the gala dinner is on uh, like June 9th, and it's this four course vegan meal created by a chef uh, locally in Vegas that I know. And so I definitely want to be able to take advantage of that because I got tickets to it, and Rochelle's going with me. So I don't want to still be fasting, you know, too, um, too much longer so I can have time to transition. But, uh, yeah, if I can go to 40 days or 35 days or something like that, I might do it. And uh, we'll see. I'm just going to take it one day at a time after I get to day 30. And, you know, no commitment there. <laughs> um, but I think if I can keep going, I will keep going. So... Uh, today's topic is a pretty simple one. I wanted to discuss this idea of just um, this, this idea I learned from Jack Canfield, which is when you want to start something new, like create a, a project and you're not sure where to begin, um, it's just this idea of leaning into it. Jack likes using that expression, lean into it. And I think he mentions that in his book, The Success Principles, as well. And a lot of people, I hear from people all the time who just they seem paralyzed to be able to act until they have like this detailed action plan gifted to them of what they're supposed to do. And first of all, I consider these kinds of people pretty annoying <laughs> um, because even if you give them an action plan, they don't do anything with it. So like people just use the lack of a detailed action plan as an excuse for not acting. But then if you give it to them, they just come up with some other excuse. So the ones who whine about, like, what are the action steps? What are the action steps? How do I get going? You know, it's, it's, it's just another form of excuse making. And the truth is, you can start any new endeavor without knowing the action steps. I mean, look up many people try new things and do different things. The action steps aren't all spelled out in advance for you. How, do you, how does humanity do anything new? Uh, you, you don't always get the action steps handed down. And even if you do, it may not be that helpful. Sure, you can model other, other people's approaches and learn from people's action plans, but ultimately you're going to have to create your own action plan most of the time. And you don't even need to get bogged down in planning every little detail. I mean, so often that's 
that whole mindset about needing that first before you can begin is just rooted in fear. It's just timidity, it's cowardice. I mean, you're, you're, it makes sense in some ways if you're gonna take a huge risk and you're like putting all kinds of investors money on something that you're gonna do some planning phase and plan things out. But even people who get investment capital a lot of times don't do that. Or they'll create the plan and then they just shove it in a drawer and never look at it again. I mean, most of the time people create a business plan, they never look at it again, and they don't actually implement that business plan anyway. It's something to show to investors and things like that. I remember you know, having to do that kind of thing when I was working with publishers in my computer games business. I'd have to create this detailed plan to convince them to sign the deal, and then I'd just shove the plan in the drawer and work day by day to get the you know, get the project um, moving along. Um, and it's just, it's a thing you do for show, you know, like business plans for the most part, it's just, it, it's, it's a dog and pony show. You just like show it off and then you never use it again. You shove it in a drawer somewhere. There is value in planning, but not so much in planning everything out in detail and then trying to implement it because you're going to run into changes and roadblocks and un unforeseen obstacles. And so much of getting things done is about adapting in the moment. Yes, it's great when you can plan everything out and just implement it. I mean, that, in software development, that, that type of approach is called the waterfall model, um, where you just you know, plan things out and you just like go over the waterfall and that's you implementing your plan and then that's it. Um, but for any kind of creative work, that, that model doesn't really work all that well. Uh, what works better is something more along the lines of an evolutionary delivery approach where you're, uh, or maybe a phased delivery or staged delivery approach where you plan things out a little bit and then you do that and then you plan that out the next phase and you do that. But, um, you know, anything like if you're working on your personal growth challenges or personal goals, almost always that requires a lot of adaptation along the way. And so this idea of leaning into it simply means just get started taking some kind of action because the action steps will appear when you're in motion. You don't really get much clarity um, when you're just standing still pondering what to do. You know, that, that's a trap. So many people do that. They just sit around waiting for divine inspiration to get clarity. And it's dumb, <laughs> you know, to be blunt. It, you're not going to get clarity by just standing still. And even when people get clarity, you know, I see this like really lame, you know, explosion of enthusiasm when they feel like they're struck by clarity and then a week later they're confused again because it's just a false sense of clarity that comes from standing still. You get real clarity when you're in motion and you're doing things and you're taking action. And then, then the pieces start to come together and the, the, you know, the big picture begins to emerge. I do think it's important to dive in with just a lot of action initially to start learning you know, the, the, the scope of whatever it is you're trying to create or work on or whatever change you're trying to make. And as you get more and more into it, then you might wanna pause a bit and go, okay, I'm getting an information overload situation here and now it's time to like, lock this down a little bit and do some planning. I often do that. I'll just go through an ex exploration phase a bit first um, and you know, with a project and then it's like, okay, now I'm getting a clear sense of all these different tasks that need to be done and I don't wanna forget any of them so I'll just start making up uh, to-do lists and plans and I use that as a general guide and it's more something to just check on when, you know, to make sure I'm, I'm continuing to make progress in an intelligent order and I might plan things out a bit, but still it's just a, it's just a piece of reference material I use along the way. It doesn't dictate my daily schedule. Still each day I'm just, you know, using an approach of like, okay, what are the action steps that I need to do? So if you want to, you know, go more into that, watch one of the previous videos. I think it was in the first five or six days or so of this video series, the one called Action Steps and I explain like how I do things on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, you don't, wanna, you don't wanna let the lack of action steps paralyze you, okay? And you don't wanna start begging people for action steps. It's just a lame approach to, to, to taking action. What you wanna do is just get one basic idea, one thing you could possibly get into and start moving in that direction. I would suggest that um, it may be good to start if you're starting in a totally new field, like read a book about it or listen to an audio book about it, maybe a few. But be careful not to fall into that as a trap because that's not really 
a great way to get into momentum and action most of the time. You know, or the same thing with reading blogs about it or listening to podcasts about it. It's a fairly passive approach. It'll feed you some information, but it doesn't necessarily get you into action. It can be an impetus for future action, but a lot of times it can just make you a bit of a self-help junkie, you know, where you're just like more and more information and you're not doing anything. There are so many people I've seen, um, it, you know, in my audience and in other people's audiences that are just like constantly reading and soaking up information and not doing anything with it. And so it's, it's a trap you want to be careful to avoid. It is a decent place to start. So when I often want to get into something new, like if I want to get into raw foods or something, I might read a book about it or start reading somebody's blog about it. Um, you know, listen to an audio program about it. Buy a course. That's, you know, that's another extension there too. Um, and it, it is helpful, but that is not going to get me to, you know, change my diet or, or make much of a difference most of the time. I might dabble in it a little bit or try some recipes, but then it'll just fade until I'm on to the reading the next book about something different. I would say one of the most effective approaches to leaning into something new and really building momentum is you've got to integrate some kind of social element to it. Joining a club is excellent. Uh, joining a new social circle of some sort. Um, getting, um, getting yourself connected with people, like a meetup group, a coaching program, something where you have an appointment, especially, you know, where you're going to show up every week to do something. Um, that, that can really move the ball forward for you. Uh, like when I wanted to get into public speaking, I'd read books about speaking, but then they just, you know, they had great ideas, but then they just went on my bookshelf. Uh, what really got me into speaking is when I joined Toastmasters, because then you're actually speaking. And I would go to the club meetings every week. And if just by showing up, I'm submersing myself with other people, and I'm guaranteed to get some practice there. And then I start working on speeches, and there's kind of a, a, a bit of a laid out program with lots of different options you can take. And they have books to work through. Uh, you know, not very long books, but more like s small books of uh, speech projects to work through, like a humor manual and a manual for professional speaking and uh, a manual for doing PR related, um, you know, speaking and, and so on. Uh, storytelling is another one. So you learn all these different skills there. Getting into that club and being in it for six years, that got me into lots and lots of speaking and doing speech contests. And it's like, once you get into the right social circle, you'll start getting more invites and you'll notice more opportunities. And so much of what happened, you know, in my development with uh, professional speaking just started with going to that first Toastmasters club. That was my leaning into it. You can go to any club as a guest for free. So just go to toastmasters.org if you're interested in that sort of thing. They have Last I checked, it was something like 10,000 clubs all around the world. So that's a great way to lean into one skill. Or you can go to meetup.com and look for meetup groups. I've had mixed results with those. Um, you know, some are really hit and miss. The, uh, the meetup group I went to for the Las Vegas Raw community was great. But some of the other ones I've gone to are just so-so. Some I go to occasionally, like a meditation meetup. Uh, but... If you could find one that you really gel with, then that's a good one to invest in long term and keep going to them again and again. Um, coaching programs, I absolutely love. Uh, I'm, I belong to a couple of them now, and it's just like, you know, there's an online resource I can access and coaching calls and things like that. And just those regular scheduled appointments, like for the coaching calls, keeps me in that mindset. It keeps me in the group and it keeps me thinking about what I want to be thinking about. Like one of them is for building a membership site. Um, and so it keeps me thinking about building out the membership site that I'm creating for Conscious Growth Club. That is, you know, just joining that, that uh, coaching program is a simple act. It just takes like a minute or two to fill out a credit card form and sign up. And then, boom, you're in. And now since you have the money on the line, you're thinking, I got to get my value out of this. And that gets you, you know, that gets you into it. So any kind of thing where you're, you know, signing up for something that's going to add a regular um, attention-getting activity to your, to your weeks, to your months, that is an excellent way to, to lean into something new. Uh, you know, as an example, when I wanted to train to run the LA Marathon, I joined a group. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. I joined a group called the LA Roadrunners. 
and they would meet near the beach and then we would go for runs along the beach and they had water stations there. And so I think it was like each Saturday morning we would do the long runs. So I would do the regular, you know, runs, the training runs, maybe, you know, anywhere from um, 30 minutes up to an hour each day. I'd be running on my own. And then, you know, we'd do these longer runs on the weekends with the group. And there, there might be like, you know, 100 people there each, each morning. If it was raining, it might be down to like 30 to 50 or so. Uh, but I, w- I would still go running in the rain because I live pretty close to the location. And it was, uh, you know, it was, it was great. You could have other people to run with. And just having that appointment every Saturday morning made sure I got the long runs done. So we would start, I think the first run was maybe 45 minutes or something like that. And then we would build up and eventually we were doing a four-hour run. And it was a bit, a bit grueling, but it got, you know, it got us all trained for the race, people who stuck with the program. Of course, a bunch of people dropped out along the way, but if you just kept showing up and you just kept doing the runs each time and, you know, get a water station set up for you and they'd have a table filled with bananas afterwards that you could just gorge yourself on <laughs> at the end of the run, um, it was, it, you know, it made it possible to do the marathon. So that was you know, that's kind of a cool thing. That leaning into it thing, all it took was just signing up for the LA Roadrunners. And I think when I did it, the sign up was on the marathon website itself when I went to go register for it or registering for a race. You know, sometimes that's a bit of a commitment. But a lot of times people can register for a race or register for some event and then not show up, if, especially if it requires a lot of training or it's a big challenge to get there. Uh, in fact, I kind of wonder how much money marathons make from people who register and don't show up. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's the social aspect. It's the getting that appointment of some sort with people that will um, encourage you and, and help motivate you and hold you accountable to continuing to make progress. That is, to me, like probably the very best form of leaning into something new. And sometimes it's just a one minute decision or a five minute decision to, you know, like, okay, I'm going to go to this club meeting or, okay, I'm going to register for this uh, coaching program. And it's that one little turn, you know, in your decision making that suddenly sends your life off in a whole new direction and getting, you know, wonderful results possibly for years to come. So, you know, that, that's that single act of leaning into it can make a huge difference and you can give you a tremendous amount of leverage if you do it in a social way. That's where I've gotten often the most amazing results is just like one decision. Sometimes it's just one email um, and, and uh, you know, or it's just saying yes, <laughs> Some, a three letter word sometimes, just saying yes to something where you get invited to it. And that can spin your life off in a whole different direction. Um, I remember, you know, getting um, some really cool connections when I was uh, a member of the Transformational Leadership Council, which was this group started by Jack Canfield. And I was a member of it for four years from 2009 to 2012. If you've seen the movie The Secret, uh, that was filmed at one of the retreats, I think back in 2004. So that was, you know, several years before I became a member. But by joining that group, I met a lot of the people um, who were in the movie The Secret and they became friends of mine. And, you know, I thought like, I kind of just fell out of the group for a while and just decided not to renew because I had different kinds of trips coming up. Um, and it, you know, they, they do retreats um, twice a year, every January and every July uh, in person. And it, it can be, you know, for some people it can be a little bit pricey to be a member because there's dues and things like that. But, um, you know, I thought, I kind of miss it. I miss all the friends I made there. So I decided to fire off an email um, to the person who sponsored me before and because it's an invite only and said, you know what, I think I'd love to come back for 2018 and be a member again. And he's like, great, you know, so um, so I'll probably be rejoining that in 2018. And it's like, you know, just that one email. It's all, all it took, just typing up an email and sending it, and now it's like that leaning into it, the ball is rolling, and I'll probably rejoin next year, and that means going to the retreats and connecting with all kinds of different people, and who knows, I might renew it you know, years after that. Um, so it's, it, it's sometimes these very simple decisions, you have to look for those leverage points that can spin your life off in a different direction. Um, and, and, you know, I'm looking for more social abundance with a lot of successful entrepreneurs, especially in the personal development in, you know, industry. And that's a great way to reconnect with, um, you know, friends I made before. 
and just add a new layer to my life. Uh, and yet, it, all it took is an email, you know, to do that kind of thing. Another way, um, just one final idea I'll share, which is kind of a, you know, an interesting one to think about, is just the idea of setting an intention. And sometimes that can be an act of leaning into something new, is set a new intention or just set a goal. Uh, and sometimes just the very act of deciding what you want and just saying, okay, universe, bring me this. Here's what I want. That can actually be an act of leaning into something and it can spiral your life off in a whole new direction. Now, you can believe in the law of attraction and think that this is happening because of some kind of energy or force out there that's bringing it to you. But another way to think about it is that you're just doing some self-programming. You're conditioning your mind to look for opportunities in that direction that you're specifying. As an example, and one which you can interpret, interpret different ways, um, when I first moved to Las Vegas, and I was, you know, that same year I moved to Las Vegas, I moved to Las Vegas in January of 2014, or I'm sorry, 2004, January of 2004, and I joined Toastmasters that same year, I think in April of 2004. So just a few months after I was in, in Vegas, after I moved here. And early on, you know, I, I set an intention that it would be really cool to give a talk, give a speech on the Las Vegas Strip, you know, at one of the casinos, hotels there, whatever. Um, I'd been coming to Las Vegas for many years. Um, I, I'd been here as a teenager before, with on, fa on family trips, but uh, I, I came here a lot when I was 21. As soon as I turned 21, I learned to count cards at blackjack, and then I would come here a bunch of times, usually several times a year, to play blackjack in the casinos, and you know, often win enough money to just pay for the trip and the hotel and the food and everything, and essentially turn it into a free like free vacation. I wasn't spending a lot of money on that kind of thing. I didn't have much of a bankroll, but it was just like a fun thing to do on the side, and. Um, I always loved, you know, just the energy, the vibe of Las Vegas, that it's, cre you know, created this crazy, you know, uh, location in the middle of the desert and just how creative all the, all the resorts are. It's unlike any other city. And so um, it was just like kind of a fantasy of mine to be able to give a speech, you know, in, um, in any kind of, um, you know, casino or hotel there on the, on the strip just to like, you know, say, hey, I gave a talk on the Vegas Strip. And it was, you know, it was just a personal goal, a personal thing of mine. I didn't think anybody else would care about it. Um, but I just, I didn't really know how to achieve that goal from when I was just starting out. So I just set it as an intention, like that would be my goal. Someday I want to give a talk on the Strip. And uh, it happened, I think, um, the, I think it happened in 2005, so the year after I moved here. And it happened in an unexpected way the, the first time. Um, I ended up giving a, a, a talk at, at the Luxor Hotel, which is the giant pyramid-shaped one. But it was a really odd location because in front of the Luxor Hotel, there's a giant sphinx. So, you know, with the, with the paws and everything. And inside one of the sphinx's paws, there's actually a meeting room. And in that meeting room, um, I, I uh, competed in a speech contest. So it was a Toastmasters speech contest and I was only giving a seven minute speech, but um, you know, I didn't know that that's where the contest would be held because I won the first level of, of the contest, which was just my own club location. But then the area level, the second level of the contest was held inside the Sphinx's paw at the Luxor. So, and I ended up winning that contest too, which was extra cool, but it was, it was fun just to like, you know, like give a talk on the strip. It was like, wow, I actually achieved that goal, but I don't really know how I did it because I didn't plan out the action steps or anything like that. It just sort of showed up. Um, now, I could say that was a law of attraction thing, that it just um, somehow came to me through the universe because I set that intention. But I can also explain it like maybe in the back of my mind, I knew, in fact, I did know that some Toastmasters clubs in Vegas met at, cas at casinos, like different casinos uh, and hotels would sponsor, uh, would sponsor um, a Toastmasters club for the, some of their employees. Like I remember the one at the Luxor, the club there was called Power Pyramid Power Talkers. And at the MGM, um, just down the street, also on the Strip, 
they're, they had a Toastmasters club, I think it was called Lion's Roar. And there might have been some other Toastmasters clubs at different locations too on the Strip. Um, but I remember that, you know, uh, those two in particular. And so, you know, I was aware of that early on, but, you know, I didn't know that they would have an area contest at one of their locations. But maybe in the back of my mind, I saw, hey, it's a non-zero probability that because there's some casino-based clubs and Toastmasters that maybe, you know, this could this could lead to me speaking on the strip somewhere. And once that happened, then it's like, you know, I ended up giving, you know, eventually evolving to the point where I did my own workshops, um, did the first first one in 2009 at um, Harrah's Hotel, and then um, I think I did four of them at the Flamingo and four of them at the Tropicana, um, and then some downtown, a couple at the Golden Nugget, and four more at uh, another location in downtown Vegas. So, and then I also did a different speech contest at the California Hotel, which is downtown. So, you know, that was, that was kind of cool. And then, you know, attending a lot of other events. I remember, oh, I did a talk, a one-day event also at the Imperial Palace. Um, that was probably around maybe 2005 or 2006 as well. So it was kind of interesting how, like, once that first one happened, then it's like a whole bunch of other ones happened too. And it still feels kind of cool to me to be able to do that. But that leaning into it act was just setting the intention. And then it led to all kinds of possibilities. And once I'd done that once, it just didn't seem like a big deal anymore. And now I could do that, you know, whenever I want. It's actually not that complicated. You just book a meeting room there and you hold an event. And you do your, you do your own talk. You can be in control of it. So, um, but I just, want, I just want to share this idea that setting an intention sometimes can get the ball rolling. So if you're... You know, if you're um, thinking of like, uh, you're not sure how to do this, at the very least, start by setting an intention for what you want to experience and try to make it specific. I like to set intentions that are binary, which means it's a zero or a one. Either it happened or it didn't. Like either I gave a talk on the Las Vegas Strip or I didn't. It's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, either I did it or I didn't. There's, there's not that middle gray area. When you set an intention that's got a huge gray area in the middle, you know, between um, you got it and you didn't get it, it's really hard to know, you know, whether it's working or not. And an example of an intention like that is, I want more money. Well, you know, does a penny count? Is that, is that more money? Does that satisfy it? Or, you know, is it like some gray area where you wouldn't really consider it being more money and then beyond that, like that's a yes, but it's really fuzzy. You know, ask for something like ten thousand dollars, and then if it shows up, if you get at least ten thousand dollars, you got it, and if not, you didn't. Uh, you know, this idea of leaning into it is actually a lot more powerful than it seems because you have to take that first step, but you've got to make a first step that gives you some kind of leverage. It's not just about you know reading an article and then setting it aside. It's it's about taking a first step that has attached to it a whole package of other steps. An intention can have that, but if the intention's not happening and it doesn't really lead anywhere, you know, don't, don't get too bogged down in law of attraction mode. Get more into action mode. And, the, you know, again, I still think the best types of actions, you know, that are leaning into it are the ones that add some kind of social connection or appointment in your life. Because when you take that type of step, it just opens up a whole floodgate of um, more action and more action and more action. And that's, that's what really, you know, moves the ball forward and it helps you achieve your goals. So, um, you know, give this some thought. Think about what can you do, you know, for any goals you might have or goals you might set or intentions you might set to take that first step of leaning into it with action in a way that is going to lead to a whole series of actions, okay? And especially, you know, something social, making, you know, getting yourself into a series of appointments where you've got uh, to show up, you're expected to do something, whether it's online or offline. Um, and, and do that today, you know, pick a goal and just lean into it, fire off an email, say yes to something, sign up for something, uh, find a club meeting and put it on your calendar to go to it. So, you know, get the, get the ball rolling by leaning into it 
with that first action step. I'll see you tomorrow.